نعم ذا حديث on the authority of hmm? أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ما نهيتكم عنه فاجتنبوه What did we learn about this hadith? What is the principle that we learn about this hadith? We learn generally two principles. The first one, principle number one. Okay, the hadith goes on like this. Whatever Allah Azza wa Jal, or whatever I have forbidden you, then you must stay away. And whatever I have commanded you with, then try, to, try your best to come with it. And indeed, the thing that destroys the people before you is the constant questioning and their argument with their prophets. So this is the hadith collected by Bukhari and Muslim. So what is the two principles? What are the two principles that we learned last week? Principle number one. Shabab. Principle number one is to be dutiful to Allah by staying away from the muharramat and by coming with the wajibat wajibat means the command the obligations the prophet sallallahu what did he say about the obligation he added the word with the best of your ability but he didn't say that with the haram with the prohibited why what did he say with the obligation you do it with the best of your ability but with the haram he didn't say stay away with the best of your ability i mentioned that last week Allah shabab okay he said because staying away is mean you know not doing an act at all in the first place you don't need an effort to stay away you just stay away you don't need to do it in the first place Whereas the wajibat obligation, it needs an effort. And sometimes effort needs you know, strength. You need to do it, you need to get up, you need to have money, you need to do this, you need to do that. But it's not given to anybody. And that is why we mentioned the principle, La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. This is a very important principle in usul al-fiqh and in the fiqh. In the chapter of fiqh, this principle is very important. And the principle number two is, Mm. To, stop, to stop asking unnecessary questions, especially hypothetical questions. Sheikh, what do you think? If this happened, what would happen? If we could fly, are we allowed to fly around the Kaaba? What kind of question that is, Yani? If you could fly, will you get a, you know, a magic carpet in the next few years or what's going on, Yani? You know, these type of questions don't ask unnecessary questions. And we mentioned last week the ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna The Muslim that commit the most or the biggest of the haram is to keep questioning a scholar, asking a scholar about something that is halal until that scholar he gives a verdict, a fatwa that it's haram and then the whole ummah they have established or adopted the haram view. Whereas initially it was halal. Example, eating bread, or example, buying from Morrison. We say, okay, is buying from Morrison halal? You keep asking, yeah, Sheikh, but you know, they're not believers, you know, they do this, they do that, they do this, they get money from Riba, they do this, they do this. And then at one point, there will be a committee of scholars in the UK, you can't buy from Morrison because of the, key, of the constant questioning. Do you think this will benefit the Ummah? This will benefit the Muslim? And then, next question, okay, Morrison, we made it haram. Asda haram, Tesco haram. Where will you go, Akhi? Will you have to. Akhi, this is not the way. Yani. Yes, as we say in hadith number two, the haram things are obvious. You can't buy alcohol, haram. You can't buy anything mixed with pork. This is haram, without a doubt. But the halal things are obvious. Inna al haram abayin wa inna al halal abayin. Tamam? So do not keep questioning, asking, constant ask, uh, question with your niya that you want to make it haram. Tamam? And we mentioned the hadith, the worst of the Muslim that commit uh, the sin is the one that keep asking the scholars with the intention that he want to make something halal, permissible, haram. Because this will harm the ummah. Tamam? May Allah Azza wa Jal make us that we will be from the people who are content with the halal and stay away from the 
haram. Now, these are the two principles that I want you to remember. And we'll get started with Al-Hadith Al-Ashid. Faddal Ya Shaykh Musa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna allaha tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Wa inna allaha amara al-mu'minina bima amara bihi al-mursaleen. Faqala ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal rusulu kulu minat tayyibati wa'amalu saliha. Waqala ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnakum. ثم ذكر الرجل يطيل السفر أشعث أغبر يمد يديه إلى السماء يا رب يا رب ومطعمه حرام ومشربه حرام وملبسه حرام وغذي بالحرام فأنا يستجاب له On the authority of Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه who reported that the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said Indeed Allah the exalted is pure and accepts only that which is pure. Allah has commanded the believers to do what he commanded the messengers. And he, the exalted, said, O messengers, eat of the good things and walk righteousness. And he, the exalted, said, O you who have believed, eat from the good things that which we have provided you. Then he mentioned a man who has prolonged a journey, is disheveled and dusty, and extends his hands to the heaven, supplicating, Our Lord, our Lord, while his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram, and he has been nourished by what is haram. So how could he be answered? Narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. This hadith teaches us an important principle. To stay pure, to eat pure, to think purely of Allah Azza wa Jal. So we will go in depth. So the principle is to eat and drink and clothe and worship in the pure manner okay we will go in depth why because the prophet sallallahu yaqul inna allah tayyibun allah is pure wa la yaqbalu illa tayyiba and does not accept but what is pure so allah is pure it is said that the word tayyib it is the name of allah it is said there's a difference of scholars is tayyib a name of allah or is it just a quality that the Prophet have described about Allah, but this is not a name of Allah? And according to the majority, not a tayyib is a name of Allah. One of Allah's names is a tayyib. How many names Allah Azza wa Jal has? From the Shabab, yalla. Hmm? More than okay, some of you say 99, do you agree? More than huh? Okay, what about the hadith, Inna lillahi? Tis'an wa tis'een asman The hadith says Allah indeed He holds 99 names Man ahsaha dakhal al-jannah Which means whoever memorizes it And of course the word ahsa means to memorize But not to memorize for mere memorization No, whoever memorizes it Whoever understands them Whoever acts upon them And whoever asks Allah through them He will go to jannah so what about this hadith? Allah says 99. The Prophet says 99. What's the answer to that? It doesn't mean that only Allah has only this hadith doesn't mean Allah only has 99. It doesn't mean that. It's like me, I'm saying I've got 10 quid in my pocket. Does that mean that I only have 10 quid? What about in the house? I don't have... Uh, no, I have more than that. Tamam? So this is the uh, correct opinion because there's another hadith, the hadith where each one of you should learn this dua, we call it the dua ul hazn, how to remove grief and sorrow. Okay, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever is afflicted by sorrow and grief, he needs to raise his hand and he needs to say, Allahumma inni abduk, ibn abdik, ibn amatik, maadin fi ibn amatik, nasiyati biadik, maadin fi ya hukmuk, adlun fi ya qadauk. Allahumma inni as'aluka bi kulli smin huwa alak. O Allah, I ask you with every name that belongs to you. Sammayta bihi nafsik In which you name yourself with Aw anzaltahu fi kitabik Or that you reveal some of your name in your book, the Quran Aw allamtahu ahadam min khalqik Or that with the name that you taught some of your creation with Mean prophet and messengers Aw istathartah bihi fi ilmi al-ghaybi indak Or some of the name, or most of the name, not some Most of the name in which you have concealed them You have not 
reveal them to us. You have concealed them with you, you have hidden them with you. Allah Azza wa has much more than that. That is why there is a principle about Asma wa Sifat. Asma Allah ghayru mahsura, which means that the name of Allah are not restricted in numbers. Allah is vast subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names are endless subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shows hada yadullu ala al-kamali wal jamal. This indicates that Allah is perfect, Allah is great, Allah is lofty, Allah is beautiful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why we should love him and we should worship him as he should be worshipped. Wallahu al-musta'an. So Allah is pure and does not accept but what is pure. And here, according to other hadith, if you look at other hadith, generally what he's talking about is sadaqah. Generally, when you look at other hadith, Ibn Rajab is said that some of this shurrah uh, al-hadith, uh, some of the uh, commentators of the hadith, they explain that it talks about the sadaqah. But Ibn Rajab is said, no, it's much more than that. Even in your action, it must be pure. How can our action be pure? Remember hadith number one, when we talked about hadith number one, what's the principle, the first principle, the first hadith we talked about? Innam al a'mal, sincerity. Even when you do an act for Allah, make it pure. Make it for His sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't do it for money. Don't do it for fame. Don't do it to please so and so. Don't do it because you, know, you don't want to be you know, called names. No, no. Do it for Allah because you want to please Allah and Allah alone. This is a pure religion. Allah Isn't the religion of Allah that is pure? Isn't Allah only accepting the pure religion? So we have to be puritan, meaning you have to be pure in your action. And of course, that goes without saying in all of your uh, life. Try to make your life as pure as possible. Stay away from impure habith and try to uh, do and um, apply your life. Try to bring all what's pure in your life. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned that what he's trying to, uh, the Prophet asked him, he's trying to explain what is the pure, what does that mean to eat pure, what does that mean to act pure. He said that Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded the believers what he commanded the messengers. What did Allah say to the messengers in, in the Quran? Allah says, Ya ayyuhar rusulu kulu mina tayyibati wa amalu saliha inni bima ta'amaluna alim. O Allah, O messengers, eat what's pure and act Good I mean do the righteous deed Don't do the impure deed Do the righteous deed Indeed Allah Azza wa Jal He knows uh, what you are doing And similarly Allah Azza wa Jal He said to the believers Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu Kulu min tayyibati ma razaqanakum Or you have believed Eat with the pure thing That we have provided for you With the good thing That we have provided for you So this teaches us That in this life Allah, he creates pure, which is a tayyib, and he creates impure, in Arabic, khabith. Okay? Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, قُلْ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْخَبِيثُ وَالطَّيِّبُ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثُ Say, they are not equal pure deed and pure items and pure commodity and pure food, huh? and the impure things, impure deed, impure food, they are not equal. Even if the, the impure things pleases you a lot, you feel like, wow, this is beautiful. Even if you feel like there's a lot of impure things. Okay? So that is why you've got to control yourself. This hadith teaches us to be, you know, to try to control yourself, control your desires, control your emotion, control your, your, um, uh, your passion. Okay, do not let this passion to lead you to, to consume the haram and impure things. And the scholars uh, in our time, they say, they mention one of the impure things that are commonly consumed uh, in the Muslim land is, they say that, unfortunately, is alcohol. Alcohol is part of the impure. The Prophet Sallallahu did say in a hadith that alcohol is ummul khaba'ith. The mother of impurity is alcohol. Tamam? And what goes with alcohol is similarly, but it's not on the same level of haram, but it's similarly, it's also classed as impure, is uh, dukhan, which means you know, smoking. 
and even worse than that, drugs. Okay, they are impure, they're not good for your health. Rather, they will destroy your lungs, destroy your brain, they will make you intoxicated to the point that you don't even know where you are. Some of the drugs are even worse than alcohol. Allah, he forbade alcohol because generally alcohol intoxicates you, it makes you drunk, it makes you, you don't know what you're doing. But some of the drugs, they're even worse than that. Wallahi billah. And that is why you've got to stay away, especially youth. Stay away from this. Do not even try to come near it. Because you feel, okay, I'm going to you know, meet some of my friends in a house full of weed and everything. But don't worry, I'm not going to smoke. No, no, I'm going to be safe. Who tells you that you're going to be safe? You're in a house of shaitan, you're in a house of devil, full of devil. Yes, you want to be friend with them. That's not an issue. But don't go to an area where you, feel, you, you see that a lot of yani, haram is happening. Rather, you invite them. Say, come to my house yourself. Let's have, inshallah, you know, pizza in my house. Come, come to the masjid. Come to the cafeteria. Come to the cafe. Instead of, you know, going to a place where these are practiced. That is why we in, invite the youth all the time. Even if, you know, they're astray, try to invite them. Come, have pizza with us. Do something with us. Play football with us. Maybe slowly, slowly that will take them away from what they are doing. May Allah Azza wa Jalla protect our children, our youth from these uh, immoralities, Ya Rabb. So we said that Allah Azza wa Jalla can only accept what's pure. And we mentioned what's pure is you have to have a pure, of course, food. And that is the halal. Halal is, all halal are pure. And all haram from the food is impure. And also money. When you earn money, try to earn in the purest way, in the halal way. Don't earn from the haram. Don't earn from interest. Don't earn from, uh, example, you know, uh, selling the haram stuff. Selling alcohol, selling uh, cigarettes, selling the haram stuff. No, earn from halal. And don't work in company that most of the company, what they do is they sell haram stuff. Try not to, go to, to, to work in this company. Try to stay away from this company and work in the halal company. And alhamdulillah, in the UK, even elsewhere, most of the company, 95% of the company are halal. I'm not talking about, of course, the alcohol company, but the other companies, you know, work in delivery, work in architecture, work in engineering, work in medicine, work. Alhamdulillah, most of the jobs in the UK are halal, alhamdulillah. So why do you have to go to the haram? And this is one of the youth arguments. One of them, I remember I had a, a little debate with them. He said, because this haram is easy to get by, easy to make money from the haram. He said, if you can find me a job that can pay me 3K, 3 grand a month, then I will leave the haram. See, this is the talbis uh, or iblis. This is the talbis, the, um, the, 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 the deception of shaitan. Yes, Allah says that whoever wants to do haram, he will get it easy. It's not hard to get haram, it's easy. But halal is hard. Why? Because it's a test, ya jama'a, ya ikhwa, it's a test. Allah wants to see how you're going to react to that. Ya akhi, jannah is not free. Jannah, paradise, heaven is not like, you know, you make one step and khalas you in Jannah. No, you need to work hard for it. Likewise in this life, if you want to be successful in your career in a halal way, in a legal way, you've got to work hard for it. You're not going to wake up in the morning and become millionaire or billionaire. That doesn't work like that. Likewise for Jannah. And the Prophet Asim says, Allah uh, wa inna Silat Allahi Ghaliyah, Allah wa inna Silat Allahi Jannah. Say that the, uh, the, the most expensive commodity is uh, the, the, the commodity of Allah, I mean the business with Allah is very expensive business. And they say, indeed, that business, that commodity that you're having and you're dealing with Allah is Al Jannah. It's not something, يعني, you need to work hard for it. Likewise, when it comes to earning money, Inshallah, try to earn in the halal way, even if it's a little money. Maybe, inshallah, Allah will bless you with this little. Allah will bless you with this little. You will not get in trouble. You will not go to prison. You will not have problem with your family. Whereas those people who earn three, four k in the haram, illegal way, drugs and everything, they will get problem. They will go to prison. They will maybe they will die because they, you know, they they were um, involved into fights and and you heard the stories. Uh, especially here in the UK, Wallahu 
al mustaan and then Allah Azza wa, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned the example of a man in a travel a long journey ash'atha akhbar ash'atha what do you translate Yani he got hair. Ash'atha in Arabic, Ash'ath is to have hair and clothes a bit like not in a tidy way. This is what I mean. What do you say in English? Disheveled, like untidy. Okay, untidy. Yeah. Jakallah. Akhbar, Akhbar means dusty. Because, you know, he's. Yamuddu yadayhi ila sama. He's raising his hand and asking Allah. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, mean give me. Oh my Lord, accept my, uh, my dua, accept my request. But he forgot that he's been eating haram and he's been drinking haram and he's been clothing haram and how will Allah Azza wa answer his du'as? So this last part of the hadith teaches us that there are many ways to have your du'as answered. The first one is a safar. When you travel, there are many ways. There are over a dozen ways to have your du'a answered. But those four that we mentioned, the Prophet has to mention, is the most likely that Allah will answer your dua when you're traveling. When you're traveling, generally you're tired, you know, you go through, that's especially before. Now, maybe not. Now we have first class business and business, like that. even in the uh, economic yani, uh, flight, yani, mashallah, you feel. Uh, but nevertheless, when you travel, there is a bit of tiredness, danger. You feel like, you know, it's dangerous to be on a plane, on a ship. You don't know whether what's going to happen. Maybe, you know, you always have that at the back of your mind, or maybe something will happen. So make dua. Make dua, and Allah Azza wa will answer your dua. One of the uh, places is when you look untidy, mean you're poor, you're not very, you look humble. The scholar, they say, even if you're rich, if you ask Allah, don't ask Allah, in, a, in an arrogant way and showing like, you know, you're wearing, you know, this and that, the, the, no, try to wear humble because you want to show to Allah that you need him. Okay, this is what some of the scholars say and that is what Allah says in the Quran, أَمَّن يُجِيبُ الْمُضَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ which means, um, who is the one who answered the one of uh, the who answered the one who is mutar, who is in need, in in uh, in uh, in uh, in deep and dire need? Wayakshifusu and the one who removes all the evils and the harm from you. Who is that? Who is that person? Who is that one? It's Allah Azza wa Tamam. And that's the third reason. So to try to wear humbly and uh, in a modest way. Akhbar means to be dusty, so again it's a sign of humility, so that you're humble, that you need uh, uh, Allah, so you, you, you beg Allah Azza wa Jal. And one of the things is to raise your hands, to raise your hand when you ask Allah. And Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu raised his hands different way. One of the ways he would raise his hand by lifting his finger, and this was narrated in uh, when he was doing khutbah when he was doing khutbah at the end of the khutbah he would do that Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and uh, Ibn Abbas he was asked why oh Abdullah why do you raise you lift your fingers when you do khutbah he said hadha dalilul ikhlas this is a sign of ikhlas of sincerity I'm asking only Allah I'm not asking anybody else Ma'am? this was narrated that Prophet Asim would raise his finger this is a way to say oh Allah I need you the other way is um, that you raise your hand that way. So the palm of your hand facing your face and the back of your hand facing the Qibla, like this. Basically up, upside, like this. This is one of the ways. The other ways, the Prophet did it, is like this. You do dua like this. So like this, meaning facing completely. So make sure your hand are up. And like this, it was narrated in istisqa. Istisqa, when the Prophet ﷺ would ask for rain. Especially in those hot countries, uh, the Prophet ﷺ would ask Allah for rain because the people would come to him and say, Ya Rasulullah, our plant, our vegetation, they're not growing. And you know, all our land are being destroyed. Oh Allah, oh Rasulullah, ask Allah for us for rain. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would ask, he would pray, he would tell people combined, we'll do uh, salat istisqa and we seek forgiveness from Allah and then he would do that at the end. Allahumma asqina, Allahumma asqina. And then some of the Sahaba say, 
only a few minutes later, you would see a big uh, morsel or a big uh, uh, cloud coming toward Medina, and uh, it would, uh, the rain would pour for a number of days. That was like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. The palm up and the back of your hand down. This is what normally people do. This is fine as well. This was narrated. Okay, you can do like this. You can do like this. This is fine. Okay? You can do like this as well. And the Prophet would also do like this. Instead of doing like this, he would do like this. He would do like this. And this is again in the prayer of istisqa when seeking rain. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the scholar, they say, why I do like this? Because it's a form of, oh Allah, I seek protection from you that you would send rain that is a punishment rain. A rain of punishment. Because rain is of two types. We have rain of rahmah. And Allah in the Quran, he would use, which word he would use for rain of rahmah? Huh? Ghaith. Jazakallah. He would use the word ghaith. Ghaith means rain. But he would use that word. Whereas the other word in which most of us now, we say it in Arabic, which is huh? matar. In the Quran, Allah, he used matar for punishment. That is why in the dua we don't say Allahumma anzil alayna al-matar Allahumma anzil alayna al-ghayth aghithna aghithna wa hakada But nevertheless now it's not like harmful to say oh matar but in the time of the Prophet if you use the word matar it's more like rain of punishment Okay, so in the Quran, remember when you read the Quran, the hadith, you will find out that the word ghaith is more rain that will, you know, help the crops to grow and everything. And matar is more of a punishment. Wal-ayyadu billah. So as we said, like this, like this, like this. But this one, the other way around, is only for istisqa, only when you do the prayer of rain. Okay, so generally like this, or this, or this. This is the three ways where the Prophet would raise his hand. So this hadith shows that it is important that we are content with the halal. Otherwise, Allah Azza wa Jal, he will not accept from you. And as a result of that, not only he will not accept from you, but as a result of that, he will never answer your dua. So you are in a lost, lost situation. Not only he will not accept from your sadaqah because your money that you earn is haram money, he will not accept from your sadaqah. So you've given it for, for no reward whatsoever. But also, as a result of that, it, he will never answer your dua. And how much do we need Allah? We need Allah. We need Allah day and night. We ask Allah. You may ask Allah, oh Allah, forgive me. Allah will not forgive you. Why? Because, you know, you're earning haram, you're eating haram, you're drinking haram, you're clothing haram. Wallahu al-musta'an. Hadith number 11. Inshallah, we try to uh, inshallah, go quick. Bismillah. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. An Abi Muhammad al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sibtu Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rayhanatuhu qal. Hafiz tu min Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Da'ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuka. On the authority of Abu Muhammad al-Hasan, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the grandson of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his beloved one. Who said, I memorize from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, leave that which makes you doubt for that which does not make you doubt, narrated by Nasai and a Tirmidhi who graded it as Hassan Sahih. Hassan ibn Ali. Which Ali is it? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Which Caliph? What number? Who was Caliph number one? Khalif al Awal. Abu Bakr then? Umar then? Uthman then, Ali radiallahu anhu. One of the ten uh, promised Jannah. Okay? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he had two virtues. The virtue of being a companion, and he has a second virtue. The virtue of being min al bayt And the Prophet sallam, he called Hassan and Hussein. He used to love them so much. Because he only had uh, two grandkids while he was alive. While he was alive. But after his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had many other grandkids. He had many other grandkids as, as boys. As boys. He had grandkids, but not as boys. Most of his grandkids were girls. Like Zainab radiallahu anha, she had a daughter. What was her daughter's name? 
the one the Prophet ﷺ used to carry her in the salah sometime. Uh, Umama, Umama bint uh, Al-As, Ibn bin Al-As ibn Rabia. Okay. Um, Ruqayya. Ruqayya, who did she marry? That's why the second daughter of the Prophet. Daughter number one is, the um, oldest is Zainab, radiallahu anha. And then the second one, it was Ruqayya. Ruqayya, who did she marry to? Uthman bin Affan. Did he have any children? No, three, four, they didn't have any children. They didn't have any children. It is said that he had Abdullah, but he passed away. Abdullah ibn Uthman, radiallahu anha, passed away. And uh, then what happened to Ruqayya three years after the marriage? She passed away, radiallahu anha. And then after Ruqayya, who did he have? I mean, uh, the, third, uh, the third daughter. Ella Sheikh. Um Kalthum. Um Kalthum, who did she marry to? Uthman again. Okay. By the way, um, it is said that Ruqayya and Um Kalthum, before they were married to Uthman, who were they married to? Uh, they were the two sons of Abu Jahl, Itba and Atiba. Atiba and Itba, I think. The two sons of Abu Jahl. But Abu Jahl, he was angry that the Prophet ﷺ did not want to leave uh, their forefather or their father's religion. So he commanded his sons. I think it's Itba. One of them is Itba. Itba bin Abi Jahl. And the other one, I think it's Atiba. I can't remember his name. He said, you've got to divorce your wives. And Alhamdulillah, they married the third best man in Islam. But Uthman Affan, when um, he did not participate in the uh, battle of, or in the Sulh al Hudaybiyya, he did not participate in the Sulh al Hudaybiyya, in the Pact of Hudaybiyya, because she, he was tending his wife, he was helping his wife Ruqayya, and she passed away. And then Uthman bin Affan, he cried, and said, Ya Rasulullah, the Prophet said, Oh Uthman, what makes you cry? You know that she will be in Jannah. She said, I do not cry for that. I cry because my relation and connection with you is cut off now. Before I had your daughter, you're my father-in-law, I'm your son-in-law, but now I've got no one. And the Prophet Sallallahu married his third daughter, Umm Kalthum. This is the, the, the love that Prophet Sallallahu had for Uthman radiallahu anhu. And then you see those Shia start insulting Uthman and qabbahahum Allah, may Allah deal with them accordingly. And then finally the last daughter was Last daughter, Fatima. Who did she marry to? Ali ibn So Fatima is a mother of Hassan and Hussein. Is a mother of Hassan and Hussein. They had daughters together. They had four daughters and two. They had three boys. The third one is Muhsin, but he passed away when he was baby. So he had Hassan, Hussein, Muhsin. Muhsin passed. Away. I mean, I'm talking with Fatima. Fatima, radiallahu anha, and Ali. Tamam. And uh, they had these two grandkids from, of Rasulullah, Hassan and Hussein. The Prophet ﷺ said that they will die young. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied about their death. He said, both of them, they will both die young. And they will be the masters of the youth in Jannah. Allahu Akbar. The masters of the youth. Naam. Radiallahu anhum. Because they were both martyred. Radiallahu anhum ajma'een. So one of them is Al Hassan, mean the good. Al Hussein, mean the little good. Al Hassan was older, mean the good, the best. And Al Hussein, mean the little best, the second best, if you could say that, because he was younger than Al Hassan, radiAllahu anhum. So they both had Ali, he was from Sahaba and Al Al Bayt, and Fatima, she is the best woman among the women, among the best women, and Fatima, radiAllahu anha. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu these three daughters, they passed away during his time. Zainab, Ruqayya, and Umm Kalthum, they all passed away during his time while he was alive, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who was left? Fatima. And then when Fatima saw Rasulullah and he whispered in, his, uh, in her ears, he whispered something, she started crying. And then two minutes later, he whispered something else, she started smiling. And then later, of course, after the death, he said, but we saw you do that. I don't, I don't know if it was Ali ibn Abi Talib or Aisha. I can't remember who asked her. He said, we saw you do that. He said, yes. He whispered to me, he said, this is my, this is my last illness. I will leave this dunya. 
She said, I know I will leave this dunya. So she cried saying, because I've cried thinking that I will be the last from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the family of Rasulullah. I'm the last one left. All my sisters have passed away. And, and then he said, whisper something I say, and you'll be the first one to come to me, to reach me after me. I mean, as soon as yani, Rasulullah died, about four or five months later, Fatima radiallahu anha passed away. And of course, his grandkid, uh, they stayed, Hassan and Hassan. Anyway, anyway, it's important that we study the family and the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This shows how little we know about Rasulullah. And this is embarrassing. He is the prophet of Allah, the messenger of Allah, the final messenger of Allah, and we don't know a lot about him. So my dear brothers, remember to study the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his family, because this will increase your love for them. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Hassan radiallahu anhuma, ala anhu wa an abi, he said, I, I have memorized, hafiz to, I have memorized, I remember, I memorized and I remember from Rasulullah sallam saying to a man, Ta'ma yaribuk, which means leave what's doubtful and take what's not doubtful. This goes to hadith number uh, six. Inna al-halala bayin wal harama bayin. As I said before, the hadith of uh, 40, sometimes they explain each other. Hadith number six talk about if you're doubtful about something in religion or in this life, is this halal, is this haram? Back then we said that it's like you're around the fence. Fence, sorry. So you don't know if... You know, you may fall into haram and then you will get over the fence and fall. But you may still be within halal. He gave us the best cure, which is, if you're in doubt, you don't know whether it's halal or haram, what to do? Simple, just leave it. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of halal. What do you have to go to this something that is doubtful? Go to the something that's not doubtful. Example, you have sweet, you want fancy sweet, oh, but the sweet got gelatin, I'm not sure. Yeah, you've got a thousand other, other sweet with no gelatin and halal. What do you have to? Or you go to your butcher and you say, I don't know if this butcher is Muslim, I don't know, it doesn't look Muslim, there's no, I don't know. Yeah, why is, no, go to your butcher that is Muslim. Yeah, and why do you have to, you know, like force yourself? Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of you know, possibilities here in the, in, the, in the UK. It's not like a time where it's not possible to have the halal. Alhamdulillah, everything is possible in this uh, land, alhamdulillah. So this hadith teaches us an important rule, and that is when you are in doubt, just leave it. Is it only in this dunya? No, even in religion. You might feel, okay, can I pray like this? Can I pray, for there's a salah called salatu tasbih. There's a difference of opinion between scholars. But salat tasbih Is it sahih? Is it not sahih? According to the majority they said that You can't do it, it's part of the bid'ah Some of the scholars they say that Some of the scholars they say you can do it Okay, now you're in doubt, what to do? Ibn Rajab rahimahullah He said From it, from it قَدْ يُسْتَدَلُّ بِهَذَا عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْخُرُوجَ مِنَ الْإِخْتِلَافَ بَيْنَ الْعُلَمَىٰ أَفْضَلْ لِأَنَّهُ أَبْعَدْ عَنِ الشُّبَهَىٰ Tamam? He said that if you see scholars differed about one topic in ibadah when I say you can do it, this salah, salat tasbih is good to do it. But the other side of the scholar, they say, no, no, this salat tasbih, the Prophet Asim, he never prayed. What would you do? You f just leave it. You don't have to do it. They don't, those who say you can do it, they didn't say you've got to do it, otherwise you go to Jahannam. They never said that. They said you can do it. So, likewise in everything in religion, if you hear a khilaf between scholars, just say, take what's the safest insha'Allah, so that you won't be blamed by any of the two parties, insha'Allah ta'ala. Any question regarding this hadith that Imam Yari book? We've explained in hadith number six, so I don't want to probably go over. Now we will move on to hadith number 12, and we will end with that. Fadal ya Sheikh, Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Fadal, Fadal, Sheikh, Fadal, ask. Bilharam. Does that mean that if someone has been, his father, for example, is earning haram, it affects the children? He's asking, that's a good question. The word wa The word ghudhiya means he's been fed. The word ghudhiya in Arabic means he's been fed. I mean, it's against his own will. Not against his own will, but he didn't know why he's eating. He's been fed. For example, um, a father is earning haram and he's feeding his children haram he's feeding his children haram the dua of the children 
Is it accepted or not? That's the question. We say that if his child knows it's a haram food, it's not accepted. He knows. But if the child doesn't know, the child he doesn't know, not the child, but let's say an older man. Okay? I know, مثلا, my father, example, that's, that's not a uh, hypothetical example. I know my father, he, his main income is uh, from haram. He sells alcohol. May Allah protect our parents. But that's not the case. And I know, I know that most of his income, 99% of his income is haram. And he's feeding me. What should you do? Me, I'm an adult now. Should you eat from it? No. You shouldn't eat from it. According to the majority, you shouldn't eat from it. Tamam? And if you eat from it because you know it's haram, then it is said, there's another hadith said that it will, your dua won't be accepted for 40 days. And this is quite problematic. And uh, maybe, alhamdulillah, us, we don't have this feeling. But I know some brothers whose parents, unfortunately, you know, I'm not talking about they're not Muslim. Most of the non-Muslim, they earn halal income. That's fine. But I'm talking about when your parents earn haram income. All of his income is haram. What to do in this case? That's problematic. You invite them and you make sure that you feed them yourself. Tamam? Okay? Wallahu musta'an. Wallahu musta'an. So if the child knows that this is haram, then he will be included. But if he doesn't know, yeah, any father feed him, he doesn't know. It's not included. Tamam? Wallahu alam. Tfadal yalla. Sari, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه حديث حسن رواه الترمذي وغيره هكذا. The hadith Abu Huraira may Allah be pleased with him said Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said from the perfection of the religion of a man is that he leaves that what concerns concerns him not or that which does not concern him. A Hassan hadith collected by Tirmidhi and others too in this manner. Okay, there's a big discussion about this hadith, whether it's authentic or not. Ibn Rajab, he, lakhas, he said that most of the expert of hadith, scholars of hadith, they say that the hadith is accepted. Okay, but there's a different of opinion. However, the text, we're not talking about the narration or the, tran uh, the transmitters, the narrators. We're talking about the text itself. The text itself, there's no doubt that it's correct. It's a principle. It's not only correct, it's a principle in the religion. Do you remember at the beginning of the course, we said that some of these scholars, they say that they would um, say that Islam evolved around four hadith. Some of them say Islam evolved around five hadith. One of them is this hadith. This hadith is a principle, fundamental principle when it comes to etiquette. That is why uh, Imam Amr, Abu Amr ibn Salah, one of the greatest scholars of hadith, in the 5th century, and his teacher was uh, Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani, rahimahullah. The, uh, we call it the Malik al-Saghir, the little Imam Malik. Ibn Abi Zayd was from Tunisia. And uh, at his time, he's following the madhab of Imam Malik. And at his time, he was called the Imam Malik al-Saghir because he was, had such tremendous knowledge, radiyallahu anhu wa rahimahullah. He said that the hadith, the hadith that combined the etiquette of all, the etiquette of, uh, the etiquette, the hadith that combined the etiquette of one person is one, one of the four hadith. One of the four hadith. The first one is, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Whoever believe in Allah in the last day, he should say good or he should be quiet. We'll talk about this hadith either next week or the week after. The second hadith, the hadith. The best of one's Islam the perfect, I mean, uh, the, the, the perfect Islam of one is to leave what does not concern him. Hadith number three is La Taghdab. Don't be angry. Don't be angry. That's hadith number 17 or 18. We'll talk in two or three weeks' time. And hadith number four is Al Mu'minu, Man Yuhibbu li Akhihi Ma Yuhibbu, the Nafsi, mean the true believer is what he loved for his brother, what he loved for himself. The true believer is the one who loved for his bro brother. What he loved for himself. So these four hadith, they are the combination of all of the etiquette of a Muslim should be. What a Muslim should be. So these hadith mean, if something does not concern you, this will not harm your religion or the person's religion, or this will not harm anyone's religion, why should you go and 
you know, concerned with his business. It's, not, it's nothing to do with you. So the scholars like Ibn, uh, Ibn Rajab, he mentioned here, example is uh, to, uh, some of them example is to say that uh, the makruhat, makruhat means something that is disliked. If you see a Muslim doing something that is disliked, makruh, it's none of your business to go and see him and say, what are you doing? Because makuru is mean it's dislike, it's not haram. Because maybe he feel, this Muslim feel like, no, I'm following this color that he say is halal. Tamam? So this is one of the examples that he mentioned. One of the examples that he mentioned, rahimahullah, is um, example, the problem between a wife and a husband. If you have a problem between a wife and a husband, just mind your own business. Don't go and get involved and try to probably even cause further yani, disruption and further conflict and okay except if one of them asks for help if one of them asks for help that's another topi uh, topic this hadith like Ibn Rajab rahimahullah it doesn't mean that nasiha is not needed what does nasiha mean? advice when you advise somebody no no you can advise somebody but there's a time and a place there's a time and a place Okay, so example, if you see a husband, you know, arguing with his wife on the street, don't go to him in front of his wife, Ya Akhi, why are you arguing with your wife? Akhi, it's none of your business. But maybe later, you could come and generally talk about, you know, methylene, especially if somebody, everybody listens to, you talk about, you know, uh, the husband and the wife should be, you know, like, uh, instead of arguing and whatnot, and so on, you know. It doesn't mean that you do, you do not give advice. Rather, it means that you should try to keep your speech to a minimum. This is what Imam Ibn Rajab said. The Prophet said, as collected by Imam Ahmed, إِنَّ مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ قِلَّةُ الْكَلَامِ The best of one's Islam is to speak, to speak less. To have the little, as little, to, to have as little speech as possible. Do not speak. As you know, uh, when you start speaking, you start texting, you start you know, putting certain things in uh, social media, you will get blamed for what you say, you will get exposed. Umar ibn al rahimahullah, he used to say, we used to live in a time, he, he lived in the last century of the first one, mean in the, uh, toward the end of the first century of Islam. He used to say, we used to live in a time where people would take their speech as part of their deed, mean that they know that they will be uh, account held accountable for it. Now we live in a time where people, they think their speech will not, it's not part of their deed. I mean, they think that you can say whatever you want, Allah will not hold you accountable. No, that is not the case. Even what you say, Allah will hold you accountable. Rather, as you will see in hadith number 24, 25, some of the Sahaba, they were not aware about that. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, one of the greatest scholars among the companions, when the Prophet وسلم, he told him, he, say, he, he showed him the way to Jannah, and he showed him that these deeds will take you to hellfire. And I say, do you want me to tell you something that will suffice you from doing all the bad deeds? And then Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He got his tongue out and he did that. And he said, kuffa alayka hadha. I mean, control this, control it. Don't let it go. And Muhammad said, Ya Rasulullah, are we going to be held accountable for what we say? And he said, Thakilatka ummuka ya Muad. The hadith is famous. He made dua against him, but it's not really dua. It's like a way to, you know, wake him up and say, you know, shame on you, Muad. He said, and how many people have been thrown into hellfire because of their tongue? A lot of people have been thrown into hellfire because of their tongue. Conflict, start with the tongue. Divorce, start with the tongue. Haram, start with the tongue. You get angry, start with the tongue. Everything start with the speech. That is why my dear brothers and sisters who are listening, be careful with your tongue. No riba, no backbiting. You may feel backbiting, come on, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. The Prophet Sallallahu he went up to beat Allah Azza wa Jal. Before he went up, Jibreel said, let me show you the people of Halfaya. And he saw one of the, a group of people of Halfaya, they were hung with their hook on their tongue. And their, until the, their tongue will be basically, you know, cut off. And then their tongue will grow again and they will be hung again. 
And then the Prophet asked him, Ya Rasul, Ya Jibreel, O Messenger of all angels, who are those people? The people who keep backbiting, keep talking at the people's back. Wallahu al musta'an, Wallahu al musta'an. That is why this tongue, my dear brothers, uh, it's important that you control your tongue. The less you speak, the less you'll be exposed uh, to sins. Wallahu al musta'an. As I said earlier, he said here again, he emphasized, he said, it doesn't mean that you can't give nasiha. Not give nasiha, but there's a time and a place for it. And I believe, inshallah, we have concluded the hadith number 12. So the principle of the hadith is that you should hold your tongue. And the one with best Islam is the one who speaks less. The less you speak, the more people will love you. And in the hadith, the Prophet I forgot to mention, he said, Ya Rasulullah, then if you want to speak, what should we say? The hadith, uh, he said, if you want to speak, what should we say? He said, Afshu salam. He said, spread salam. Say salam wa alaykum to each other. Wallahi, you feel like I love somebody. I don't know that person. Example, I know a couple of brothers, I don't know them, I never met them, I never, but I love them because they keep saying Salaamu Alaikum, Assalamu Alaikum, they keep giving Salaam to you with a smile, with, the, so you feel that you love them, even if they speak very little, you don't know anything about them. So the Prophet asked him here, he told the companion, he says here in a hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nah, I've, I've lost the. Uh, nah, it's, it's not in here. But um, uh, when you spread the salam, is one of the ways, inshallah, that will save you from. هذا حديث آخر لكن في هذا الحديث يقول يعني إن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه ثم قال وقلة الكلام ثم قال يا رسول الله فبماذا نتكلم معنى الحديث قال أفش السلام أما الحديث يعني أول ما سمعته هذا حديث عبد الله بن السلام رضي الله عنه نعم هذا حديث معروف نعم فضل نعم أيوة هو هذا 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 الحديث يعني بعض الصحابة عبد الله بن السلام يقول رضي الله عنه يقول يعني um, I heard about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم coming to Medina قدم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة and I heard that in مكة they were calling him liar and everything فقال عبد الله بن السلام فرأيته أول ما رأيته عرفت أن وجهه ليس وجه كذاب ليس وجه كاذب See, I knew when I saw his face by looking at his face I know he wasn't a liar he wasn't the liar lying type ثم قال أول ما سمعت عنه شيء and the first thing that I heard from him is شيء أفش السلام وأطعم الطعام وصلوا والناس دينيام تدخل الجنة بسلام which means that from, from the first piece he heard that is why Abdullah ibn Salam he was a rabbi he was a Jew but what uh, what يعني convinced him to Islam and brought him to Islam is the beauty the, the beautiful speech of our, our Prophet Islam. He said, the first thing he has, he said, Sp uh, spread peace among you and feed the poor and pray in the night while people are asleep and you will enter in Jannah. And the way he said it, he said it in a rhyming way. Afshu salam wa at'imu ta'am wa sallu wa nasu niyam tadkhulu jannata tadkhulu jannata rabbikum bisalam. Tadkhulu jannata rabbikum bisalam? Huh? Naam, hakeza naam. Fa... نعم ناس نيام تدخل جنة ربكم بسلام نعم may Allah عز وجل admit us in Jannah يا رب any more questions inshallah before I let you go inshallah today we did three hadith because last week I was a bit in a rush but inshallah next week we'll only do 45 minutes inshallah we'll not go over that inshallah تفضل يا شيخ But for some parents pass away, I can't hear. Parents passed away, but the earnings went to Haram. He passed away now, but he did not inherit. What should they do? Okay. If some of the parents pass away, and uh, what they inherit, some of them 
you know they're haram, you know for a fact, not you doubt. You have to know it. Tamam? Because what we think of Muslim, always think good of Muslim. Don't think he's a Muslim, let me find, let me investigate whether he's a good Muslim. No, no, that's not our job. Min husn Islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la yani. One's best Islam is to leave what does not concern you. You're not allowed to investigate. Don't spy on each other. Okay? But you know for a fact that all of his life, his income is haram. Then هذه المسألة اسأل غيري الله أعلم. I don't know. الله أعلم. نعم. Mm. Can you call, sure, he said that maybe you know you span in the manafi uh, al-amma, meaning general, uh, pub, uh, يعني, how to say that, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, that what benefit the public. It doesn't have to benefit one or. I heard about riba. Riba is an example. If you receive your in reception of the interest money what should you do with it they say that you should you shouldn't give it to a poor because this money this money is haram money is impure money and allah azawala say anfiqu min tayyibati ma kasabtum when you give to the poor you should give the pure money don't give the impure one so they say just spend it what benefit the public like on the road you know on the post you want to do something. It's not benefit to one pe one person, one family. It has to be like the vote, the post, and these things. It's beneficial for everybody. Ma'am? Allahu A'lam. Some of them say, you know, these things. Allahu A'lam. Allah. Okay, but the um, question about this dua, you, from the means that you narrated, we didn't, some of the people like we do like this, so then we can do it. Ma'am? No, the Prophet asked him, he's asking, he said, can we ask the dua, especially when you need and you, you raise your hand? So, no, this was narrated by the Prophet asked him, especially in his tisqa. No, the Prophet asked him, like Hadith Abu Huraira, he said that when he would ask, especially in, uh, in Ba'iwa, Ghazwad uh, Badr, Ghazwad Badr, Ghazwad Badr, he would ask like that to the point that his cloak and his shield would fall down. And another narration that he would see the uh, whiteness of his armpit. The armpit was so wide. If you do like that, can you see the armpit? You can't see. It. You have to do like that. Tamam? But do you have to? No, you don't have to. Example, no, this one is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a sign that you need Allah. You're begging Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And Allah, He loves when we beg. The Prophet he said that, Inna Allah, yuhibbu an yulaha alayhi su'al. Allah, He loves when we beg Him and we keep asking. Because this is a sign of our need for Allah. And Allah, he doesn't like, he hates when, no one, when we don't ask him. So you know what, I don't need to ask Allah, I've got everything. Allah, he hates that. You need to show humility and that you, you need Allah. And the second thing is, especially for us back home in Gambia growing up, so the dua, the norm, when you make dua every time. So how does the understanding of that, and we do that in every scenario, He's asking about if <clears throat> the dua, you raise your hand, after you raise your hand, can you do like that, can you do... This is a matter of difference between of, uh, scholars, khilaf between the ulama. Alladhi ta'arafa alayhi al-ulama, what's common among the scholars, this is sunnah. This is sunnah, you can do any time, any place. Tamam, you do like this, and then you do like this. This is sunnah. This was narrated in dua qunud. This was narrated in Hadith Ibn Abbas. This is what last four or five hadith of Bulugh al-Maram. Maybe we go to Bulugh al-Maram. He said, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he was asked, why do you wipe your, ha your hand? He said, I hope that Allah will answer my dua, and the first thing that Allah's mercy will send uh, to is to my hand. Allah's mercy will send, he will send his mercy to my hand. I want Allah's mercy to go over my face. Tamam? However, a group of Hanafis, a group of them, especially the early Hanafis, and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Al-Qayyim, 
they are the only three or four scholars who say that it is bidah. It is not to be done all the time. It's to be done sometimes in places where the Prophet ﷺ did. And the correct opinion, and Allah knows better, at the hadith, is that you can do it. You can do it at any time. This is the right. Muhammad Abdul Wahab, he was upon that madhab. He said that you can do it. Ibn Kathir, this is what the majority of the scholars say. Tamam. And the argument of Ibn Taymiyyah is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never did in any other places. He never did. But we have a statement from the Prophet, statement, hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say that yani, if you do it, it will, he did it. He told his uh, Hassan, his son, Hassan, by the way, this hadith, da'ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuk, it's a long hadith. And in this hadith, he told Hassan the dua al-qunut. This is the same hadith. And he said, do this. So there is a, uh, it's a matter of different of opinion. So if you see somebody do it, don't be harsh on him. Oh, bid'ah. No, it's a bid'ah. We say it's bid'ah if before the first four or five generations, they never did. Ever, ever. They never talked about it. Now, nah, bid'ah. Tamam? Mathal al-mawlid. You know what's mawlid? Mawlid. Although we love Rasulullah. Naam. Nahnu nuhibbu nabi sa'asla. Sahaba, they never celebrate in Mawlid. Tabi'i never celebrate in Mawlid. Tabi'i, Tabi'i never Mawlid. Na, never until 5th century, they start to celebrate. We say, no, this is bid'ah. Naam. Naam. And whoever believes it's not bid'ah, uh, yani don't, you know, don't declare war against them. No, ya, akhi, they are Muslim, they have their opinion. Khalas. Whereas this thing is a matter of Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed, he said, this is from the Sunnah. Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik. Yani la bas, yani there's no harm, Allahu alam, there's no harm about it. Especially that it was narrated, the Prophet did it. Like in Salat Istisqa. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, he did it in Istisqa and that's it. Ibn Taymiyyah, he goes with this opinion. And that's an opinion, and Allah knows best. I know we've been taught, oh, it's bid'ah, bid'ah, but yeah, jama'ah, we need to be, inshallah, before you know, rushing into saying bid'ah, it's not har you need to study first. Study first and find out. And be, yani, hadi amana ilmiya. This is a trust. Be honest and honest. spread the knowledge as you've learned. Don't feel, oh, this brother might talk against me. Ah, he don't care. Yani, you're gonna have to, you know, uh, stand before Allah. Now, what will you answer to Allah? Allah said, why did you hide this knowledge? No, this is this is what we've been uh, we've been taught. And nah, fadal, fadal. He has a question. Fadal, fadal. If someone now makes dua for like you get something but haram, make dua for Allah to give you something but it's haram. Okay, <coughs> now that's a good question. Why is uh, someone ask Allah for do we, uh, to give you something haram? Allah will not accept that dua. Okay, the Prophet asked him, "Qul yustajabu lil mar'i ma lam yakun li qati'ati rahm ma lam yustajabu li dua il mar'i ma lam yakun li ithmin aw qati'ati rahm." مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ لِإِثْمٍ أَوْ قَطِيعَةِ الرَّحَمِ Which means that everyone's dua will be answered as long as it does not involve haram, it does not involve asking haram, or asking uh, that you will be cut off from your uh, relatives. If you say, oh Allah, uh, destroy my cousin, or destroy my mom or my dad, astaghfirullah, yani, Allah will not answer your dua. The other way around, the other way around, Allah will answer. If your parents make dua against you, Allah will answer them. Because that means that your parents are angry with you. If they are angry with you, Allah is angry with you. Alihada, youth, remember, don't anger your parents. Obey your parents. And dad, mom, remember, don't make dua against your kids. Don't make good dua again. You can shout at them and everything, but don't make dua. dua. Don't say, oh Allah, destroy you. You'll be not successful in your life. Ya akhi, maybe your dua will be accepted. And sometimes you have this speech in the back, back home, you have this speech like, uh, may Allah give you this. No, you, can't, you can't say that against your child. Don't say that. Even if you don't mean it. Tamam? That is why ask Allah, parent, dad, mom, ask Allah. Even if they do, Ya Allah, guide my son. Guide my son. And youth, don't anger your parents. Obey your parents. 
أقول أسأل الله عز وجل أن يوفقنا وإياكم هذا والله أعلم صلى الله على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you.